All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our colloquium with Dr. Jessica Flick. Um, before we begin, I would like for us to first take a moment to be mindful of the fact that UBC's Point Grey campus, uh, where we're ho hosting this colloquium, is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam. Um, I'd also like to point out that in the BC Lower Mainland, um, we live and work on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Salatooth, and other Coast Salish people. Um, and given the hybrid format, this colloquium, people are likely joining us virtually from other areas as well. Um, so wherever you may be at the moment, I ask that you take a moment to pay respect to the original caretakers of the land um, and to acknowledge both the past and current contributions of indigenous peoples. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jessica Flick. She joins us from the Department of Psychology at McGill University, where she is an assistant professor in the quantitative psychology and modeling area. So broadly speaking, her work is on psychological measurement. Um, so obviously in a field like psychology, we deal with things that are kind of inherently difficult to measure. You know, we can't so much put a thermometer in someone's mouth and have it tell us how extroverted they are. So we generally need to do a bit more work um, to make sure we're measuring things uh, that we want to measure appropriately. Um, despite this though, measurement has unfortunately often been a neglected aspect of psychological research. Uh, Jess's work, however, has been very influential, not only in clear, clearly showing why uh, poor measurement practice is harmful to our science, uh, but also in providing and disseminating tools for better practice. Um, as she'll talk in a lot of detail about today, I believe, her work is highly relevant to research reform that has occurred in recent years, trying to improve the replicability and overall quality of psychological research. Um, and I think her work will continue to be, um, continue to make a positive impact for many years to come. Um, in addition to her many impressive publications in top journals, she does a lot of other important things that I feel really benefit our field as a whole, um, including disseminating material from her methodological courses and making them openly available, um, serving as associate editor, editor of Advances of Methods and Practices for Psychological Science, um, hosting information sessions to help recruit students from underrepresented backgrounds into quantitative research, um, and establishing and continuing to direct the Data and Methods Committee of the Psychological Accelerator, uh, which is a very large laboratory network coordinating large-scale data collection across 84 countries. Um, so despite being a new professor, she's already accomplished a great deal, um, and I'm very happy that we have the opportunity to hear from her today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jessica Flake. Okay. How is the sound? Awesome. So I'm going to run a timer so I can keep track of my time. I will also say I had a cold a solid two weeks ago and I still have a little bit of a tickle in my throat. So I've got some water here. Hopefully I'm not having a cough attack uh, during this talk. Uh, but thank you so much for having me. Thanks to Jason for inviting me. He mentioned inviting me here and he said, well, you know, it's not for sure. I'll suggest you and then people have to vote. It seemed like a, a big deal to be here. So it's really uh, nice to be here today. Thank you so much. I don't know how I like snuck in. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that Jason mentioned, uh, but I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. So I've, I've hit a few milestones recently. So last year, it has been 10 years since I taught my first class on my own. And this summer, I'm spending my tenure dossier. So I've been thinking like, what have I been doing? And how does what I did relate to what I'm working on now? So this talk is like more of a broad overview of how I got to this interest in integrating measurement practices into what is now um, a methodological reform movement in psychology. So like, let me see if I can, oh, wait. Yeah, it worked earlier, but um, make sure the mouse is in the right spot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So like Jason was saying, uh, my research is generally on psychological measurement. I'm in a quantitative psychology area of a psychology department, but measurement isn't all about methods. It's this two aspect situation where we need a lot of methods, but we also need a lot of theory to measure things. And so my research is a little bit of both. It's not just quantitative methods. So I'm interested in psychometric models, latent variable models, how we develop instruments and how we provide ongoing evidence for instruments. But also I've worked in 
applied projects like some of you have where I'm thinking about how to define a construct, how to understand how constructs fit together in a causal system, and really just doing deep thinking about unobservable entities, which is often where we find ourselves in psychological research, like Jason mentioned. So like I said, I'm going to do like a little bit of a broad overview of the stuff that I've been working on um, throughout my career. I'm going to start by talking about my earlier research on evaluating and developing latent variable models, and then discuss how I transitioned into using meta science as an avenue for developing methodological practice, and how that led me to the open science and methodological reform movement, which is related to what I've been working on recently, and what I'm doing now and what I plan to be doing in the near future. So first, I'm going to talk about um, evaluating latent variable models, particularly models to assess the psychometric property of measurement equivalence, which I'll explain in a minute. So I, this is a pretty broad audience, and most of you probably know what psychometrics are, but just to be really general and give a broad explanation, and like Jason said, in psychology, measuring stuff is hard in any scientific discipline. So it's hard to like measure what a tree is. I think we often say psychology, it's harder to measure. No, it's hard to measure in every scientific discipline. They've just been doing it for hundreds of years and we're kind of like new to it. But we also have this specific challenge, which is that we want to know what's going on inside people's heads, like how they feel, what they're thinking about, their attitudes, their political ideologies. And we need to take what's going on inside their head, give them some kind of stimuli and turn that into numbers that have some sort of meaning. And generally what we're going to do is we're going to assign people to do some stuff, fill out a survey, do some sort of task on a computer. We want to convert those responses into numbers. And we usually want to say something like those with a higher score are more of the thing than those with a lower score. So psychometrics in general are a set of models and methods aimed at quantifying psychological phenomenon. They're not readily quantifiable. And there are a lot of psychometric models. There are network models. There are latent class models. There are component models. A lot of my research is focused on one of the most popular measurement models in psychometrics, which is the common factor model. So I'll run you through that really quickly. Um, one of, I know the mic is on this side and it's a lot louder when it looks this way. So I will try not to do that. Um, so one of the areas substantively that I've worked in a lot is developing instruments for understanding students' achievement motivation. So why do students persist in education? What motivates them to study and be successful in their classes? Stuff like this. So the common factor model has a certain theoretical assumption with which these latent factors are out there, something like motivation, they're inside people's heads. And if we give them something like surveys or questionnaires, that motivation is gonna cause them to respond in a certain way. And the item responses are gonna correlate with one another because they're all caused by the same thing, motivation. So this is the sort of common factor model or common cause theory that underlies factor analysis. You could also think about it that when we give people items, like say 10 items to measure students' motivation, that we're gonna decompose that item's variance into two parts. The part that's shared, that's caused by motivation, and the part that's unique. And that's expected just to be like random measurement error. So that's the fundamental kind of short version of it. This is just a schematic. It's not like a technical statistical graph. So I've been interested in um, an aspect of this. It's a little more complicated, but pretty applicable to a lot of situations in psychology, which is measurement equivalence. So measurement equivalence is also sometimes discussed as differential item functioning detection or measurement invariance analyses. It's a pretty technical topic in psychometrics, but it's actually a topic that you've probably encountered in your everyday life. So I'm just going to explain it like conceptually with an example from my everyday life. So this is Lola. Uh, this is my late dog, Lola, but she lives on forever in this talk. And she was uh, quite a chiller, even in the height of her life when she was younger. And there was always this issue that she was too lazy and she wouldn't exercise and that she wanted, we wanted to live as long as possible, right? So we're always watching her weight. So it was a big aspect of Lola's life, going to the vet and getting weighed and discussing whether or not I was feeding her too many treats. So, you know, going to the vet, and this is... This makes Lola's actually heavier than this. He's, this is a real scenario, but these numbers are not real. But this really happened. You know, Lola's going to the vet and uh, the usual. And we went to the vet a few times and it looked like she lost a few pounds. And a straightforward way to interpret these data is that Lola lost weight. Seems as if she lost a few pounds. But I really doubted this interpretation because I was not cutting back on treats and Lola was scarfing down her food just as if she always did. It seemed like that there was this other potential interpretation, which is that something about the scale or the measurement environment had changed. 
And in fact, that was true. It was the second time point that we realized that it was a new vet tech and they didn't realize that Lola was like leaning against the wall when they were weighing her. So something about the measurement context or environment changed. And this is, this is an interpretation in a lot of our psychological data. We see that we use instruments to measure psychological phenomenon. It can be over time. It could be across groups. And we want to attribute any changes we see to an actual change in the thing we're studying. But there is always this other potential interpretation, which is that something about the instrument changed or the measurement context changed or the understanding of the measurement instrument changed. And that was definitely the case in the situation with Lola. So we can formalize this using latent variable models, um, various psychometric methods. I'm going to talk about it from a structural equation modeling perspective. So taking this idea of the common factor model that I was talking about earlier and making a more simple diagram, because I don't want to draw all these complicated diagrams in PowerPoint, we can add a little bit of a statistical, some statistical properties to this diagram. So we can say that we want to quantify how the items are related to the factor. That's their loading. It's interpreted like a regression coefficient. And then we can also quantify the mean value of the item after controlling for the factor, so the item's intercept or its threshold. And then these little arrows here indicate that there can be some error variance left over in the item. In the measurement equivalence context, what we're saying is that if an instrument is equivalent, it's these statistical properties that are equivalent across time or across groups or across contexts, whatever it may be. So we're gonna say, well, if we use the instrument in one context, its psychometric properties are equivalent to if we use it in another context. And just to be really concrete, if an item is an equivalent, that would look something like, well, it's 0.8 in this context, whereas it's 0.65 in this context. I'm gonna talk from now on about the multiple groups context. So the, the situation where we've got one group of people who took the instrument and another group of people who took the instrument. And if we wanna interpret whether or not these two groups are different on their motivation, we'd like to rule out that there are measurement differences going on there. There's a lot of quantitative and technical research on these models, but they do matter substantively. So if you have non-equivalent items and you don't account for them statistically, they can make groups look more similar than they are, or they can disguise, um, or they can make groups look more different than they are. So it can bias your interpretation of group differences. But something that I think is really interesting about this, say this scenario here, where we've got a group that's a 0.8, we're saying that this group, the item is a stronger relationship to the factor than this group that indicates that there's some differential validity going on. This item isn't as strongly related to the factor in this group. And I think that this can really help us have theoretical insights to group psychologies that go a little bit beyond just saying, oh, I wanna check this box and make sure my measures are equivalent. Well, what if these differences in how people are interpreting the items is something actually interesting about how they're interpreting the world thinking or thinking about the concept that you wanna measure. So I think that it can be substantively uh, relevant. I started thinking about this issue because, very small side tangent, before I went to university, I worked for a, a program for at-risk youth in an inner city school where I grew up. And uh, we were studying students' motivation and their success and seeing that a lot of students who go to university would ultimately drop out. And so when I then went to university, I was working on understanding motivational climates in, at university that contribute to students dropping out. And some qualitative research that was going on at the institution was about why students in some majors drop out more than students in other majors, and in particular in STEM fields, like engineering or science fields, stuff like that. So we had all this qualitative data that really suggested there was some difference in the motivational climate of different majors. Like students get into majors and things happen. Motivationally, things happen. And so I started thinking about like, maybe we could pick up on students thinking about their motivation differently by seeing if they interpret items or think about their motivation differently and if that could translate into this issue of measurement equivalence. So, you know, to make it kind of simple, I could say, oh, well, how does the engineering major respond to our items? Is it equivalent to how the chemistry major responds? Or is the, how the chemistry major responds equivalent to how a philosophy major responds? Or how does a philosophy major respond? Is that equivalent to how an engineering major responds? And I thought we might lend some understanding into what was going on in these like little micro motivational climates. Um, but I didn't have just a couple of majors. I was working with the institution that had data for all majors on campus. So I had like 30 majors. Um, and you might say, oh, you know, just like have your grad student run all those analyses. And I was the grad student and I was willing to do it. 
Um, it, that sucks. But also, it's not likely that you're going to find the true pattern of results in this scenario. So in the traditional structural equation modeling approach for testing this, it is a pairwise comparison. So it's a multiple group factor model where you compare two groups, you compare two groups, you compare two groups. It's hundreds of comparisons. It's thousands of statistical tests. So I don't know if it's like luck or what have you, but I was sitting in a workshop that Bank Mutain was giving. And he was talking about this thing called the alignment method. The alignment method is a relatively new method. It was published um, by Tier, uh, Tiramira Karloff and Bank Mutain and Structural Equation Modeling in 2014. I will ultimately do my dissertation on this method in 2015. So I just happened to be sitting in this workshop when Bank was talking about it. And basically what he was saying is that it completely automates this process. So it doesn't matter if you've got three groups or 30 groups, you can estimate all their measurement models at once and then use an algorithm to automatically test which items are non-equivalent. Something that I'm not gonna go into too much detail about, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about is that one of the assumptions of these kinds of models, actually this is like stressy. Um, one of the assumptions of these kind of models is if you wanna test one item for its non-equivalence, you need to know which items are equivalent first. So you need to get the groups in the same metric so you can see if other items are non-equivalent. That's an assumption of all of these models. In the traditional uh, multiple group factor model framework, you have to decide which items are equivalent, the anchor items, so you can test the others. Well, the thing about the alignment method was that in theory, the algorithm was going to do that for you. So it seemed like a pretty uh, a neat advance. And I had all these applications in mind that I thought it could be used for. So I decided to do what all good graduate students of quantitative methods do, and is to run a simulation. So I thought, how well does this method work? And how do we know, if we don't have to pick which items are equivalent, how do we know that we have enough for the method to actually produce valid results? So I did a simulation study. Um, and I was interested in the estimates from the model. So how good are like the loadings and the intercepts that I talked about earlier? but also how good it was at ranking or quantifying the group's levels of the uh, construct. And so I did a simulation where I looked at the estimates of the model and I varied how different the groups were and their item responses, how many items were different or non-equivalent and the number of groups. So I generated a small number of groups. Um, something I'm not gonna talk about too much today is that I'm, I'm also interested in using multi-level modeling for these kind of data structures, but you really need to have a lot of groups when you do that to get good estimates. So I think that the alignment can, it can be a good approach when you don't have enough groups, say 30 or 50 to use a multi-level modeling approach, but you have way too many to do that pairwise comparison stuff. Um, and I simulated if all the items were equivalent, just a few or nearly half, if the differences were big and small based on numbers from other simulation studies, and if the non-invariances on the loadings or the thresholds. I'll say that I, I, I know that in a simulation study, the devil's in the details. I'm like not giving you any details. I'm going to keep this sort of high level. Uh, just to sort of trust me. If you want to know more about the details, you can check out the paper and also the code and all of the results are on the OSF. So you can like really dig in and find my mistakes. Please do. Um, so it was a two-factor model and seven items on each factor, factor four-point Likert data. The data are actually simulated off of real large-scale motivation data from a nonprofit testing company. So the item parameters are not all the same. They're built off of um, real item parameters. I'm not going to go into the details a ton, but I'll say that this method actually works pretty well. And it starts to break down when you've got a third or more non-equivalent items and the differences in the item parameters are actually quite large. So I'll show you some results that are just from the large difference condition for the thresholds. The large difference for the loadings was 0.4. So that's like a 0.4 in one group for a loading and a 0.8. Now that's a pretty big difference in a loading. It goes from like being pretty bad to pretty freaking good. Um, and then with the threshold, which is um, an item intercept, it was a 0.8 difference. So I'll show you some of those. So the first thing that you can see with this method, even when it's not working, is that you don't have a type one error problem. So you're not going to say that items are not equivalent when in fact they're equivalent. So if your items are equivalent, you're going to not think that they aren't. Okay, that's good. Well, really where this breaks down is in the power domain. So if your loadings are not equivalent across all of the large um, conditions, they were only correctly identified 10 to 60% of the time. It was a little bit better for the thresholds. Those were correctly identified when they were non-equivalent 30 to 98% of the time. I know I'm talking about a simulation study with a structural equation model and a simultaneous estimation of all these measure models across many groups and the data are ordinal and it's all complicated, but this is a power problem. And the same principles apply that apply in interest stats. 
either has something to do with the effect size, something to do with the sample size, or something to do with the criterion level, like you learn about intro stats. The criterion level for flagging an item in non-equivalence with this method is 0 0.001. That's fixed. The sample size is 500 per group for the entire simulation. So there has to be something going on with how we're estimating the effects. So these are the effects. So I had simulated a difference of 0.8 between the thresholds. So this is the real value for two items across all of the replications that are in the large magnitude condition. And basically what we see is that the estimates are downwardly biased. When you have a lot of non-invariance, the thresholds aren't estimated as well, and they look more similar to each other than they in fact are. And so they're not flagged as significant. You can't find it, basically. Um, and we also see that there's not a lot of precision in the estimation. Across replications, these estimates bounce around a lot. This is not the same for all items, though. Some items, the procedure works better for in others, even in this worst case scenario. So item 10, you don't see as many dots because the estimation is more precise. It doesn't bounce around a lot. And a lot of the dots are down here at the bottom, closer to the true value. The difference between item 10 and these two items is that item 10 isn't as skewed. So item skewness, or when you have Likert data, sparse responding in some categories can really influence the estimation. You might have 500 people per group, but if not a lot of people picked option one out of your four point scale, you actually don't have a lot of statistical information. So it's a little more complicated than just thinking about sample size. So some conclusions I took away from the simulation study is that the alignment is a really powerful tool and it works pretty well when the assumptions are met, like all statistical models, right? But you can have a few non-equivalent items, nearly a quarter, and they can be pretty non-equivalent, like big differences. Um, and the important difference between a regular structural equation modeling approach is that the researcher doesn't have to correctly specify those items ahead of time. So I think that is an advantage of this method for sure. But as non-equivalence goes up, the estimates are biased, the factor means and factor variances are biased, and the item parameters can look more similar than they in fact are. And you get into this like crappy situation where you've got non-equivalence, but you can't actually detect it. Um, and item skewness is contributing to this, and this is consistent with other methods. So it doesn't like fix the problem, but I do think the method can work pretty well. So this is my dissertation research. I did a simulation study, and this is the part of a quantitative psychology talk why I would now tell you about four more simulation studies I did on this method, but that's not what's gonna happen. So, I finished this up being really interested. I'm an applied methodologist, right? I want people to be able to use methods, you know, uh, for them to be accessible, for the methods to actually be applied to theory, develop best practices, and demonstrate how to use new methodologies like this. Because the rate of advance in latent variable models is like it's like going toward the singularity. I mean, it's we're getting so many more methods over time. So I would say that's really the crux of my interest. And I went into my postdoctoral research um, to start thinking about how I could use meta science to further develop methods. And this wasn't really my idea. So I did my postdoc with Jolyn Peck, who's at uh, the Ohio State University now. And she had done this systematic review on how researchers were using mediation. And it blew her mind, like changed her life. She's changed. She's not the same after that. So I, she was like, oh, you're really interested in all these complex models. Why don't you first see what people are actually doing as a way to develop practice? And so we decided to do some meta science stuff. If you're not super familiar with meta science, the basic idea is that you use science to study science. And um, I think that particularly as methodologists, it can motivate the development of methods through understanding more current practices. You know, a lot of quantitative researchers toil away in obscurity on their pet models or methods, but the um, uptake of those methods by the larger community isn't, isn't very, um, this not up, they don't uptake it. And for me, we'll talk about how it can really just be a reality check of learning, having your ear to the ground about people are actually using the methods that you're studying. So we decided to do this review of measurement practices. And the research question that guided this review is how are researchers using measurement equivalence analyses to inform theory? So there's a lot of new methods up and coming about how to do these psychometric models. And I was interested in how they could be used to answer questions like the motivational climate question that I was talking about earlier. And so I looked at uh, papers that were published in a very theoretical journal, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology is also a prestigious journal. 
And um, we took what we thought was a small random stratified sample of articles published in 2014. It's 30, reading and coding 35 articles published in JPST is not small. It took thousands of hours. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and we found that researchers are using a lot of instruments. They're using, there were 700 measures used across these 35 papers. And most of them were surveys or item-based scales. So I've been talking about for those of you who don't do survey research at all, you do cognitive tasks, or you do some sort of like brain imaging research. Like I know I haven't really been speaking to you um, and I'm sorry, uh, but most of the instruments used in this area of research are surveys and they're relied on really heavily. Um, and a lot of those are one item scales. So I'm gonna share with you some results of this study, but I'll answer this research question now. How are researchers using measurement equivalence analyses to inform theory? They're not. They're certainly not if they're testing it on one item, right? Um, so the main finding from this review is this one. This is complex chart it shows the finding. So nearly half of instruments will be used and it will not be reported where they came from. So to make this really concrete, imagine that researchers are study, studying self-esteem. 53% would say studying self-esteem and cite Rosenberg. 40% would say we studied self-esteem no citation or reference to where the instrument came from. And 7% would say, we're studying self-esteem. We developed an instrument to study it. So that's what those results mean. So if we look, okay, maybe there's some, okay, there's not measurement equivalence in there, but maybe there's some other psychometric stuff going on that we could think about. And so if we're looking at the psychometric information for the instruments that had a citation, most instruments are gonna report in addition to the citation, some reliability coefficient that's predominantly Chromebox alpha reliability coefficient. 21% will report something more. That's actually usually another reliability coefficient, like a test retest. And then some will just report nothing else. So, you know, we used Chromebox alpha, we used uh, Rosenberg, that's it. For the unsighted scales, so the scales that don't have an apparent source, the uh, most common thing that's reported most of the time is a reliability coefficient. A small percentage will report something else more and 19% will report nothing else. So this is, we study, we used items to measure self-esteem, no other information, no, not even a rely, reliability coefficient. So this is sort of this like come to Jesus experience in my postdoc where I thought I was gonna like go do more simulations on different measurement and variance studies related to what I saw in these papers, but I didn't see any at all. There's like just not a lot of use of psychometric methods for advancing theory. And the best practices that I learned about are just like totally not in use, not even reported at all. And reliability seems to be completely replacing all the stuff that I learned about for years that encompasses validity. I mean, I didn't tell you what all that stuff is, but there's entire textbooks about it. Um, and reporting little to no information about instruments seems completely acceptable. And this isn't a premier journal. This isn't in like little journal that no one reads. And so if you read a bunch of these papers back to back and to back, something else that'll kind of pop out to you that you can, you can get a hint at here, but that's through the lines is that questionable practices are just really common. So the things that you see about the instruments are things like pulling apart scales, so say a scale has 10 items, well, splitting that up and analyzing all the items separately or adding up two scales together, like making an index of multiple scales, um, adding and removing items for no reason that it is at least reported, using scales that are just, they seem to have just been made up on the fly. And then in JPSP, where the average number of studies is four or five per paper, say this study is the whole paper is studying self-esteem. Well, study one uses Rosenberg, but study two uses some other self-esteem measure. And by the time you get to study three, it's the combination of the two. It's just this like really willy-nilly approach to measurement. This is in 2016 that I'm reading all these papers. And we're also having this like big conversation in psychology about reproducibility and replication. So before I talk about this graph, I just want to asterisk this term reproducibility. So in the early days, reproducibility and replication, those terms were conflated, but just to separate them now. So when I say the term reproducibility, I mean, if I have the data and I have the materials, I can get the same results that were reported. 
versus replication where I'm going to collect new data and I want to know if I get the same results. So just to separate those, these are conflated in this graph, uh, but nature, you know, back then was like, hey, researchers across different fields, do we have a reproducibility crisis? And 52% were like, yes, a significant crisis. And I'm going to talk more about how um, measurement relates to replication, but just like a meta point on measurement and replication, 38% said there was a slight crisis. So it's a lot of people thinking there's a crisis and clearly nobody quality checked that item. Um, so instead of running the simulation studies, I was like, I need to be writing about this. We're talking about questionable research practices a lot. I don't think we're talking about this issue in measurement, which get, affords so much analytical flexibility that isn't um, completely recognized. And so I got with my friend and colleague, Iko Freed. He does a lot of research in uh, depression measurement, and he's done a lot of systematic reviews. So he's had his own come to Jesus situation with how depression is measured. And so we decided that we would define this term questionable measurement practices. And we said that there are decisions that researchers make that raise doubts about the validity of the measures in the study, but and ultimately the final conclusion. And the core aspect of a questionable practice, uh, well, there's two core aspects. One is that they lack justification. So you split the scale up, but why? You don't report why. And they lack transparency. So you don't report everything you did and you don't report the steps that you took to make those decisions. And um, in the questionable research practices literature, there's a lot of discussion about how people are questionable because they're nefarious or they're trying to pee hack or they're unethical. I don't really see the need to engage in that. Um, I think that the core problem is that the information is missing. I'm not personally the police, so I'm not thinking about why it's missing, but the reality is if the information is missing, you have questions. You read the paper and you're like, what? Why? What? Why? That's questionable. I think a lot of questionable practices come from people just not knowing what to do. Some of them come from people trying to misrepresent their data. Some come from just like the pressure, of, you know, publish and perish is how I'm starting to think about it. So questionable measurement practices, no matter why they're there, they make it difficult to impossible to evaluate the validity of the study. If you don't know what's going on, you don't know if it's any good. And they certainly make it hard to reproduce and replicate studies. And so if you want to not be questionable, you can read the paper. We have a short list of questions that you can answer so you can avoid being questionable. But the um, this is where I started thinking more about how, how could we even replicate these studies if we don't know what was going on in the first place. And so I wanted to specifically look at this issue of these measurement practices and how they play out in replication research more specifically. So I've since done systematic reviews of some large-scale replication research to get at this question. So um, one of the largest replication studies ever conducted in psychology is the Reproducibility Project Psychology. That's the RPP. Some of you here have uh, contributed to this. So the way the RPP worked is that 100 studies were selected, and then a data collection lab would sign up to collect data to replicate that study. And the studies were spread out across um, Journal of Experimental Psychology General, JPSP, as I was talking about before, in psychological science. This is in contrast to the mini labs projects, for which there have been five now, um, where fewer studies are replicated, but multiple labs collect data for the study. And what this results in is larger data sets for reanalysis. And so I think both can be useful for thinking about measurement. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about both. I'm not actually going to share all the results from these reviews. Very si similar methodology. We read all the paper, we read all the original studies. We we'll read all the replication studies. We see what's being measured. We see if there's any validity or reliability information reported about those measures. What we find for the original research, this, this is a much bigger review than the original than the one I told you about, the JPSP review. Um, it's very similar results. So a lot of item-based scales, a really heavy reliance on single item measurement a lot of instruments that are made up on the fly and almost a complete replacement of reliability over validity. And this like magical number, it seems like you can just always have a 20% of your instruments that just have no information at all. So no source, no validity evidence, nothing about them. So really consistent with what I was telling you before. Uh, I will say that JEPG is a little bit of an exception 
in the sense that JEPG has less survey-based measurement in it. So a lot of reaction time, a lot of lab-based tasks. And when we saw those tasks, we sat them aside, though I think the validity and reliability of those tasks is important too, but they're not reflected in these results. Um, so something else that we did here, though, is we looked at the replication reports. So you've got this really lack of information about the instruments in the original studies. How does that end up playing out when you try to replicate these studies? So back in the day, it was not standard practice for replicators to report any psychometric information in the replication report. These replications are really focused on calculating the primary effect. There's not a lot of focus on other aspects of it. This will go on to be a critique of it. I, I, think, I think it's valid. Um, I don't think they could do everything or know to do it back then. Um, so you don't see like less than half of the reports report a reliability coefficient, for example. I mean, this is a part of what I'm thinking on now is how we can change replication research to address some of these issues. But in this initial batch, you don't see a lot of me measurement consideration. I mean, one way you can interpret this that I think is valid is that these replication studies have even less validity evidence than the original. But the data are open. We can go back and take a look at that stuff if we want, which I think is um, a, a selling point of this kind of research. Just to give you a little sense of the results, so these are the instruments used in the RPP, and we broke them down by primary, meaning that they were used to calculate the replicated effect versus secondary, like an exploratory measure. And this just shows that like in the original study, you know, about 10% of the instruments had a factor analysis. This is gonna be instruments with more than three items. And whereas in the replication study, I think it was like one replication study, um, did the factor analysis. And then the original, you saw about 50 reporting, 50% 50 reporting a reliability coefficient, whereas in the replication study, you don't see as much reporting of a reliability coefficient. But we also read these reports. I mean, the measurement is clearly, um, there's a lack of transparency with the instruments and a lack of rigor with the instruments, but there's not really an avenue for evaluating the instruments and the replication reports. So we're also just reading them to see like, is there any hint that something went wrong? And in 16 of 100 reports, the replicators will formally say there was some measurement issue here, like something went sideways. And in general, this poses a really serious challenge for the conduct and interpretation of replication studies. So we looked across, what is this? Rogue. It's rogue. Wow. Um, so we looked across all of these challenges and we organized them into these like four main issues that are likely measurement problems that are likely to come up in replication research. And it starts from like being the most simple to being the most complex. And so the first issue is just that there's really limited information about measures. So like two concrete examples of this, study 46, the item wording was unclear in the original study. They got, they contacted the original authors and the original authors were like, oh, we can, like, can't quite remember what survey we used. I'll say like the reproducibility crisis, it's good to be able to reproduce yourself later. And that, that's, a, that's a really good reason to adopt these practices. And then you can reproduce yourself later. Um, and they realized after they ran the whole replication study, they just never used the right survey. So it's like just, you can't even do the thing because of that information missing. But other stuff, even if you know you have the right items, you might not figure, be able to figure out how to score them. So in study 91, um, the scoring method was really unclear. So they would like add the items together or average them together. They could never get a number that was like within a, the realm of what should be possible based on the original study. So this is really fixable. Like if we are more transparent about our instruments, we can replicate the studies, at least knowing that we can utilize the same protocol. The second issue of just the instruments, even if we had all the information about them, they don't have strong validity evidence. It's a little bit more of a scientific problem. It's not just like a transparency problem. So is that like rogue figure now back? Um, so, you know, you could, you, when we run a replication, what we're trying to do is provide some evidence for the validity of the original claim. So the original claim is some theoretical claim. And you're doing a replication study so you can say, oh, if I get that result again, I'm going to have more confidence in that claim. That's like the basic idea. You're, you're trying to do replications to evaluate the conclusion of the original claim. And in the replication crisis, we're really worried about how those co conclusions might be negated by like, say, p-hacking or 
um, not having big enough sample sizes. We're doing things like pre-registration. And that completely ignores this whole other more foundational issue of measurement. If, if you have an instrument that has no validity evidence, it's like not even measuring the thing that you think it's supposed to measure. It doesn't matter if you have a big sample or if you pre-registered it. I mean, even if you replicate the study, the conclusion is invalid. So there's this whole set of studies that were replicated when the instruments themselves were so, they lacked evidence that I don't even know what you would learn from doing a replication. This is a sort of like crack at the foundation or replicating garbage kind of problem. And I think um, we spent a lot of resources replicating studies that at their face didn't have very clearly didn't have strong evidence at the outset. And they might not even be worth investing the resources. So that's another issue I think we need to think about in replication resource, research when we select studies to replicate. Um, we're finally going to get back to measurement equivalence now. So something else that happens in these studies is that there are apparent measurement differences. So we talked about earlier how we would like to rule out measurement differences when we interpret our data. This assumption also holds going from an original to a replication study. You don't want there to be substantial measurement differences from an original to a replication study because you want the replication result to lead an insight that's theoretical, not that's a measurement artifact. And so you can kind of read between the lines in the RPP and see that this assumption does not hold. So one example, study 92, I think it's a relationships uh, research study. There was a lot of scales used in this study. And in the original work, those subscales had alphas of like 0.8. 0.9, you know, something that we would all agree is a pretty good reliability coefficient. But when they ran them in the replication study, they were like 0.5 or 0.6. Um, in study 41, they had averaged items together because they were highly correlated. Well, when the replicators analyzed those items, they weren't significantly correlated at all. The one study that did a factor analysis found a different factor structure different factor, like different items mapping onto different factors than in the original study. I don't even know what the replication result in that case would represent. And so this issue of measurement equivalence uh, is really important for replication research and entirely neglected when replication studies are interpreted. And there's another level of this, which is even more complex, which is that a lot of instruments are translated in these studies. So in the RPP, 40 instruments were translated, um, but only eight of them had previous versions. So the replicators are translating these instruments themselves. And I will give it to the replicators. They were thorough. They weren't just like translating them without any effort. They were doing multiple uh, rounds, forward translation, back translation. But even with really um, rigorous translation methods, it's hard to measure a construct equivalently in multiple languages. Like the Assessments that do that and do a decent job have like real people working full time, like the um, TIMS assessments and the international educational assessments. And so I think there's a lot of reason to doubt, doubt results where translation is involved. Um, we know for sure that two studies used, used the positive and negative affect schedule, which does have a decent base of research on translated instruments and has found that the translated instruments have non-equivalence. We have to be really careful about when we use that instrument across cultures or across different languages. One of the limitations of the RBP, I'm like sort of like, like telling you like through the lines of this, some of the psychometric problems that I think are going on, but you can't actually analyze any of this stuff directly with the RPP data because the studies are not large enough to do that. So the um, replication studies were powered based on the effects reported in the lit literature. And they'll ultimately end up seeming underpowered because we now know that the effect sizes were inflated in the original literature. But even if they were like spectacularly powered, the power, the sample size you need to do, run a t-test and the sample size you need to run a multiple group factor model is really different ball game. And so these data are not good for actually evaluating the instruments. And that's why we took a look at the mini labs because this is a much bigger data set. Um, so I've been talking this whole time, like I did all this work and nobody helped me. These are the grad students who led this project. It's my student, Rage. She uh, led the project. These are the other student co-authors on this paper. We took a look at the Mini Labs 2 data and the Mini Labs 2 has uh, a lot of instrument translation. Those instruments were translated into 16 different languages and data were collected at all of those um, hand implemented dots on that map. Uh, so we pulled the instruments. There's a lot of judgment decision-making 
studies in this. So there's a lot of single item and task-based measurement. There's not a ton of survey measurement in this actually. So we took a look at all the scales that had more than three items where we could actually test some like basic assumptions about them. In particular, if they were unidimensional because they were treated to be unidimensional in the replication study and to test their reliability. So there were eight instruments that met that criteria. Again, I'm not really going to show you the results. I'll say that you can trust me that for three out of the eight, there was like completely unacceptable model fit for a unidimensional structure. You've got a good chunk that are sort of in that mediocre zone where like you could go either way and then you've got a few that were quite good. And it would go the same for the reliability. So there were three out of eight that were like clearly unacceptable. Nobody would think that the reliability was acceptable. There was a good chunk people could argue. And then there were a few that were quite good. Um, and the instruments, they're not necessarily the same. Like some of the instruments that have good model fit don't necessarily have good reliability. Um, but going back to this issue of measurement equivalence, we can pick up on it in the reliability. So this is the reliability from one of those eight instruments. The Chromebox Alpha is on the x-axis here and the data collection lab is on the y-axis. So I'll like point out a few things about this graph because I know it's sort of hard to see. Um, first, data collection labs vary in their sample sizes by a lot. So like this data collection lab only has 16 participants. And that means that when we estimate its reliability, it has a bigger, bigger confidence interval. So the labs aren't all you know, giving equally precise data. Something else to notice is that reliability is poor overall for this instrument. I said three out of eight were unacceptable. This is what I'm talking about. This is the dotted line is the average across the whole sample, it's like 0.48. This is a replication study and its result was interpreted when one of the main measures had a reliability of 0.48. Even if you don't care about validity at all, it's certainly an issue for statistical power. Um, but the thing that kind of comes back to this issue of measurement equivalence is that on average, translated instruments are less reliable than instruments that were just administered in their original version. Lower reliability means lower loadings. And so in the mini labs and in most large scale replication studies, all of these data are pooled. So they're combined together, which completely ignores this sort of um, measurement heterogeneity. So even though the, reliability, even though the uh, data from the mini labs is a lot bigger, it's still not really big enough to do a formal analysis of measurement equivalence in the traditional sense. So of all of these eight instruments, only one of them had good enough model fit to proceed with a full psychometric analysis. So I didn't really talk about this, but measurement equivalence testing is a pretty confirmatory methodology. You need to know what the factor structure is. You need to have decent model fit for that factor structure because you need good estimates so that you can then test those estimates for equality. It's not something you just like do on some instrument you just made up, which is a lot of these instruments in these studies. So we found one which is the old version of the Moral Foundations Questionnaire at this point, a new version uh, has come out recently. And so we were able to test this instrument to see if it was equivalent across translated versions for the original that was English, for participants who took it in Spanish and for participants that took it in Dutch. Um, this study has a lot of problems. It says that it's in revision. I don't think that it will get published. I'm just gonna you know, tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the main issue with this is first, even though the Moral Foundations questionnaire was the best questionnaire in the entire Mini Labs 2, it wasn't good enough for the editor. So the editor is like, mm, I don't know, this instrument is kind of crap. Like, you can't publish a paper with it. Also, when you run the equivalence analysis, there's two uh, factors here used in the replication study, binding and individualizing. I'm not really going to get into the details of that. But th these numbers just mean that there was not equivalence on this item parameter. So there was not equivalence on most of the intercepts across this set of items. If you've got a lot of non-equivalence, you start to get into some of those problems I was talking about earlier. So the editor was like, well, the non-equivalence is so bad, we can't publish a study. Which I was like, okay, I know, but this is the best instrument. Can't we publish a paper that talks about how this is a problem in replication research? And she was basically like, no, you need to go find a better example. So I'll like do that for a long time now. Um, but if you, if you correct for the non-equivalence, so we're talking about a situation where we're compiling all the data. So if you just ignore the non-equivalence and look at the scores on this factor, this is Dutch, English, and Spanish. So the groups look pretty similar 
But if you take into account that most of the intercepts are non-equivalent and calculate a factor score, you can actually see that the Spanish are a lot higher on this construct. And so we really are combining data together from participants who are interpreting and using the items differently. And if we account for the differences in how we use the items, we would actually give them a different score. They would appear a lot higher on the construct than they would in the observed score. Again, probably rejected, but a sign that this is a real problem in replication research. So I did all these meta science studies and I saw all these problems. Um, and uh, you know, one of the main takeaway is is that uh, measurement isn't a trivial aspect of replication. It's actually a really big challenge for replication. And that a lack of validity evidence can completely prevent replication studies from getting off the ground. Um, and large scale replication studies and innovation that I'm really dedicated to in this discipline, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, actually introduce measurement non-equivalence because of translation, which like undercuts the goal of the study, right? Um, and these are, we're finally circling back around to the alignment method. These are complex data structures. They're nested data structures. They're data structures that come from many heterogeneous groups. And because of um, translation, we should expect that there'll be a lot, a lot of measurement heterogeneity. And um, unfortunately, the instruments that were used are not psychometrically sound enough to even evaluate the assumptions. And when we do evaluate them, the results are pretty troubling, but in a lot of cases, we can't evaluate them because the sample sizes are too small in the first place. And so this is what leads me into thinking about how my methodological research can be used to change how we do these studies. So how we can in increase transparency, make replication research more worthwhile, more valid overall, and how big team science um, can help with that. So I've talked about the replication crisis a lot now, and I think a lot of you are familiar. Just as like a tiny bit of background, you know, there were like some things that happened in the early 2010s that kicked off this crisis. There was like data fraud and failed replications, and we realized that there was p-hacking going on. Um, and there were arguments about whether or not there was a replication crisis. I mean, I read all those JPSP papers, so I think there's a replication crisis. But there were some people who didn't think that, and there maybe you were some of them. That's okay. Um, what we can agree on though, is that there's like been a real methodological reform movement. Like things are actually changing. There are new publication formats. Open science practices are incentivized by journals. So one of the areas that I'm working on is um, how to develop the practice of registered reports. So registered reports are a publication format where you're peer reviewed before your results are known. This is a graph that you can't see, but in 2013, they launch at Cortex. By 2019, over 200 journals are offering this new publication format. So this is like real change, like real methodological reform. It's not just like people complaining about a replication crisis. And uh, all APA journals now offer badges. So you can get like a little badge if you share your data or your, or your materials, um, or if you pre-register your study. I would say important for you know the last little bit of my talk, um, one of the values of the open science movement is that transparency is an avenue for increasing rigor. I think if we have the information, we can evaluate it, we can call out information or, you know, studies that aren't valid. Um, and there's a really high value placed on reusability, reproducibility, and replicability. So I've been thinking a lot about how my work can contribute to that, particularly in the context of latent variable models and more complex uh, statistical methodologies. And so this is just like rogue. These are just go rogue sometimes. Um, so yeah, so I think like as methodologists, you know, we can't just sit back in this replication crisis and be like, oh, we told everybody how to do it. And they didn't listen, right? I think that as quantitative methodologists, we need to engage with the community and help develop practices. And so I've been thinking about how I can change my methodological scholarship to go away from simulation studies on models that nobody will use. Um, and also how I can use what I know about complex methods to change how we do large scale studies so that they can uh, be more useful. And so I'm thinking about um, how to focus on transparency, do simulation studies that help justify decision-making and um, demonstrate for researchers reproducible pipelines that can be pre-registered, particularly with methods that have a lot of decision points. Um, and this involves selecting methods. Something that we've done in quantitative methods is that we've given people a lot of methods. 
I wouldn't say that we've really given them a way to navigate the garden of forking paths that all of those methods can ultimately lead to. And so I'm thinking a lot about how to reveal the garden, how to navigate the garden. Um, in the case of large scale studies, I'm thinking about um, how we can develop pipelines for really large scale heterogeneous measurement data. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my work with the psychological accelerator on that and um, how we can evaluate and curate complex methods so that other large scale studies can use them. So one of the things that I've been working on throughout the background of all of this that also gets me thinking about a lot of these things is um, the psychological science accelerator. So as Jason mentioned, um, I'm a founding member of this organization. It was founded by Chris Chartier in 2017, and it's a distributed laboratory network with thousands of researchers on um, all populated continents. And we want to increase the quality of the data and the representation of psychological data. And so we would like put out a call for studies and anyone can say, hey, I have an idea. Can I run it through the accelerator? And we would review it. And I review the methods parts of those proposals with my little team. Um, and then if we accept a study, then member labs can sign up to collect data for that study. And this is a completely like volunteer going off of people's enthusiasm situation on a shoestring budget. It was at least, we're finally starting to get money now. Um, but we really do have an open science perspective. First, you can't run a study with hundreds of people unless you develop standardized protocols that are easy for everybody to access, but we also share all of our data um, and all of our materials. So I was the leading methodologist in our first ever published study, which was a person perception study and one of the uh, leading authors. And so this study asked the question of what dimensions underlie perceptions of faces. If you're not that familiar with person perception research, that's okay. The basic idea is that when you look at a face, you might rate it on a bunch of different traits, but those traits can be reduced to two dimensions, valence and dominance. And so we did a large scale replication of um, a pretty influential paper, Ostroff and Todorov, that was published in 2009. And we basically did this study in a, more, a much larger, more diverse way. One of the limitations of the original study was that it was a quite a small sample, quite a homogeneous sample, and the stimuli were like, like white bald heads. Um, no offense. <laughs> okay, at least there's just one of you in the audience, okay. Um, so as, as you can see, there's only one white bald head here. We're actually more diverse than that. And so the stimuli database is a lot more diverse. And importantly, the participants themselves are more diverse. So there's over 11,000 people who participated in the study from 41 countries in 11 world regions. So when I'm, I'm like, I know I spent like 15 minutes talking about the alignment method early on, but we're talking about a situation where we need to assess if a measurement model is equivalent across a really diverse set of people. So this is like a huge issue in these studies. These are the um, different world regions. I'm not actually gonna share the results of the study. It mostly replicated, but not enough for Todorov who is pissed at us. Um, it is diverse. It is the case that you get a different structure in some cultures. I think that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, but this study, so I was the leading methodologist on this study. I'm in theory, I'm supposed to be an expert on the quantitative methods that we were using. This is a registered report. So we had to plan everything out ahead of time. Well, don't you know, once we saw the results, there was something I realized we didn't plan for. That's how hard this stuff is. So, you know, we added some stuff to it after the fact and we figured it out and it's reported in the paper. But I really think that there's a need for us to develop transparent uh, methods for researchers to follow. So, sorry. I'm um, so something that I worked on after this with my graduate student, um, Raymond, is writing a tutorial where instead of just doing your standard tutorial and complex model, which would be like, how do you run the model? Here's an example. We instead said, we're going to take this, these two options for measurement equivalence testing, the traditional approach and this new approach, the alignment, and reveal the decision, every single decision that a researcher has to make and a justification or the different reasons you could make that decision one way or not. So this starts with just um, some initial psychometric assumptions and goes all the way through different ways of doing model fit evaluation. And so this is part tutorial. We have these like interactive R markdown documents that have code, they have output, 
Um, they also have like narrative text that explains technical details of the models. But another aspect of this, which I think is quite rare in a methodological tutorial, is a complete pre-registration template. So this paper is organized around the decision-making process. So if you were doing a registered report or a pre-registration that would involve a psychometric analysis, every step is there and you have a filled in pre-registration template that you can work from that shows um, various ways that you can make all these decisions and justify. So like no questions after you read this. So that's the kind of thing that I'm working toward in my methods research is trying to generate um, materials that others can reuse so that they can engage in the open science movement and they can analysis plan, even if they're using more complex methods and those practices are typically applied to. So we're getting toward the end here, peeps. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, that's, you know, kind of like all in the past. So now I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes at the end telling you some of the stuff that I'm working on with my lab and what I'm gonna be working on over the next like year or so. And that's basically thinking of instead of doing large scale replication, doing large scale validation of instruments. Um, and thinking more about mixed methods. I'm thinking like if I can get tenure, I'm just gonna become a qualitative researcher. So I'm gonna talk a tiny bit about that. Um, okay, so I my grad students are like doing most of the work. Um, and so my student Raymond, who I, I mentioned briefly before, he is an expert in measurement equivalence. We wrote that tutorial. And so he, what he's working on right now is in the Psychological Science Accelerator, we're trying to develop a way to formally evaluate all translated versions of one of our instruments and make those psychometric pipelines and produce validity reports that could be um, reproduced, but also that same method could be used in a different study. So that's something that he's working on. That's a registered report. Doing a registered report for that kind of analysis is super hard. I've learned a lot. Um, this is Mairead Shaw. She's actually uh, worked with Jason quite a bit. She's really interested in effect sizes, but she's uh, for multi-level models and really interested in developing didactic materials. So uh, Jason developed effect sizes. You might've heard your colleague. And so we worked with Jason to um, develop an R package. that's a little bit easier to use in a tutorial. And so she's thinking about proposing her dissertation now. And we're thinking about how we can like expose and navigate this sort of multiverse of decisions that researchers can be faced with in multi-level modeling more specifically. So looking forward to working on that. Um, this is Lindsay Alley. She's actually a West Coaster. She's really interested in mixed methods. So she's been looking at the mini labs data and measurement heterogeneity across different kinds of samples. So we talked earlier about measurement heterogeneity that can stem from translated instruments, but also in these uh, data sets, data are collected on different platforms. So they might be like crowdsourced, they might be from Project Implicit, they might be from MTurk, they might be collected in data collection labs. So we've been doing some work on that. Um, and she's been thinking about how you might use interviewing or qualitative data to help understand some of the results when you have these really complicated measurement situations. And so she's working on developing um, protocols for cognitive interviewing that can be used to lend insights to psychometric studies. Um, and lastly is my student, Jake. I didn't have time to talk about this, but I still do uh, some research related to educational uh, psychology and educational measurement. And he is working on forced choice surveys. It's a different kind of response format for surveys where you're forced to choose an option instead of ranking on a Likert scale. And it's really hard to assess measurement equivalence with those kinds of data. So his dissertation research is going to be about that. The big thing that I'm thinking about is running large scale construct validation studies instead of large scale replication studies. So um, the psychological science accelerator and I pitched this idea to the Einstein Foundation to uh, develop this process for translating these instruments, evaluating their psychometric properties, sharing that information, and then engaging the community to reuse these methodologies so that they're Every time we do a large scale study, we always go through this process. So we sample size, plan, so that we can psychometrically evaluate the instruments. And my long-term goal is to use these large scale studies as like an engine for valid measurement. And I think that reusing materials for researchers that are all over the world can maybe be a bigger impact than any given study we would run, right? Because we have all of these materials and we have data that can be reused. So we pitched this idea to the Einstein Foundation and I was a finalist, but I didn't win. Um, but the Psychological Science Accelerator took home 200,000 euros for infrastructure building. And so we are thinking about how to add these measurement infrastructures into our studies 
And I'm going to, of course, recycle the idea that I sent to the Einstein Foundation for the upcoming fall grant writing season that takes place here in Canada. So that's what I'm going to be thinking about over the summer. Um, I think that's all. Thank you guys for listening. And I will take questions now. All right, yeah, so um, if you, for those of you in the room, if you have a question, I'll pass the mic to you and then um, also just raise your hand on Zoom if you'd like to ask a question there. Thank you, this is so interesting. Um, you, of course, said, you know, you work, you generally worked in the survey methods and you kind of put the others to the side. Um, and what might you have to say about other kinds of methods in which, of course, we care about reliability, but it's not quite as straightforward? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I get emails about this. And I know that there are a couple of, of there are people working on formalizing. Um, there's a really interesting paper that came out in perspectives about in integrating like computational modeling and the kind of cognitive approaches we see with construct validity theory to generate validity arguments for these other kinds of measures. So there are people working on that and, and thinking about that. I think that all the stuff that we think about for validity for surveys can be applied to any measure. You're starting to see some stuff about how AI is used in, related, in relation to validity other stuff about physiological measures and like what, so, you know, say something like skin conductance, does it actually represent the thing that we're trying to measure? So like I'm in circles where I, you know, people will kind of chatter at me about there, there are some people uh, working on that stuff. I think that um, where, where we have a, a longer history of formulating some of those validity arguments and survey testing. It's just not the same kind of nomenclature that you see in other areas. Uh, but I think people, people are thinking about it and they're having the same, I don't know if it's a measurement crisis that we're in, but also the same kind of replication and reproducibility discussions with those in those areas. And that's all kind of going together. So I think people are thinking about it. I'm um, happy for them to do that. <laughs> And thank you so much, Dr. Flick. Uh, my question, uh, actually, I'm from the management field. Uh, I'm Ryan. So I, my question is about, um, I'm really excited about talking about your large scale validation studies. Um, actually, uh, my interest field also validity and validation, especially validation practice and method for validation study. My question is that what's your view of validity? Because, you know, the ARA, uh, mm -hmm. NCME, MPA, they, the, their view of validity is more uh, score interpretation <laughs> focus, so or um, score use more for test uh, industry. But what's your view of validity? Just internal structure like a CFA mm -hmm. or, um, and because there is one student in your film do mixed method, uh, cognitive interviewing actually is using for response process based mm -hmm. evidence. So I just, my question is what's your view? And yeah, thanks for asking yeah, that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have, I have a view. I teach measurement theory and that whole is a whole semester. And I didn't talk about validity theory at all. Um, my view is definitely in integrating multiple sources of evidence for test use and interpretation. I think that plays pretty well in psychology as well as in high stakes testing. So um, like take the case of measurement equivalence in a large scale replication study. We want to combine all the data. We want to use those instruments to uh, compare everyone. And so thus we need certain kinds of evidence to support that claim that everyone's comparable. And I think the good evidence for that is your kind of traditional psychometric stuff, but also cognitive interviewing and qualitative researchers to research to make sure that um, people who speak different languages are interpreting the items the same way. That's one of the reasons that we've gotten really interested in cognitive interviewing uh, for identifying, I didn't have time to talk about this, but I'm really interested in response processes as evidence. I think that um, showing that participants are thinking about what you think they should be thinking about 
It can be very strong evidence, stronger than a factor analysis. I think factor analysis is sort of useless without some of this. I mean, I know I'm studying it, but I think it's sort of useless without this more qualitative um, stuff. And so one of the biggest challenges, say, in a large scale construct validation where you have a lot of translated instruments is how would you know which items can serve as an anchor set? I think really the only way to know is ask people who speak multiple languages to give you qualitative information about those items. And I didn't, I didn't talk about this, but in the project that um, Raymond and I are working on with the Psychological Science Accelerator, we actually had bilinguals give us feedback on every single item. So instead of using an empirical exploratory approach for identifying anchors, we use a qualitative approach instead. So that's where some in Lindsay's interest in mixed methods is coming in. So um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to integrate these different sources of validity evidence, not just kind of like psychometric models. Um, so yeah, I certainly take that, you know, bigger, more evidence-based approach. More evidence is better than um, no evidence to answer your question, but I didn't talk about it here, sorry. Thank you. I think that was a was a really fascinating talk. And my question concerns sort of promoting the adoption of better practices. Um, and, and I really like the part of your talk when, when you said that in your view, it's not really that most people who do practices and maybe suboptimal do so because of nefarious intent, but really, really mm -hmm. often lack of knowledge. And I think your work is, is really you know, making a lot of progress in, in helping to, to educate people and includes myself and, and many others who aren't quant first and foremost quantitative psychologists. But I wonder if the other part of this is also related to misaligned incentives, um, you know, will continue to dominate our field. And thinking about this sort of a, a dilemma I find myself in quite often is when I talk to graduate students and it seems like what I'm suggesting to them to write good papers is basically do everything. And it's like, you know, what, what I think if we think this through to the end is what, what you're proposing will make research slower, it'll make it more expensive, it'll make our papers longer at a time when more and more journals are actually forcing us to write shorter papers. And, and where reviewers no longer want to have a 200 page supplement, and I'm one of them. Um, mm -hmm. And so we I pay want, somebody to read that. I'm not reading that. Right. And yeah, so I wonder yeah, what, you. And, and, you know, I, I fully recognize that it's unfair to put you on a spot because you're already doing so much for the field. I, you cannot single handedly solve this, but I wonder what do you think we as a community could do to also help with that part as a prerequisite of more widespread adoption of better and more thoughtful practices? Yeah, that's a good question. I think about this a lot. Um, I'm actually going to this reproducibility workshop thing after this where I'm, we're supposed to be talking about intervention strategies for some of these problems. And I was preparing for that. I went on this like, spiritual quest almost where I realized that writing another paper isn't going to fix the problem. Like I've written some papers now, turn it in my tenure dossier. There's no more I can write that are going to change that. What should I do? And so I, I, I actually asked Brian Nosek, you must have came to a point where you were like writing another paper. I'm going to do something different. You know, you like started the center for open science. You decided to do something different. So I met with him. I was like, you know, what do I do now? I don't think it's writing another paper. And he was like, you know, if, if you like leave academia to go work on some of this like policy stuff, that like could be a good outcome. And we talked through one particular. So one of the things I'm interested in is like a long answer to your question. One of the things I'm interested in is that um, is making simulation studies completely reproducible. This is way more work for authors, totally to your point. Um, and that we shouldn't publish a simulation study. I mean, we, the data are made up, okay? They should be reproducible. And I don't think a simulation study should be published unless it's reproducible. And if I, and one of my friends was like, well, let's write a paper about that. I'm like, that's not gonna fix it. And so when the editor of Psych Methods asked me if I would join the editorial, become an editor in the fall, I said, yes, because that's the way for me to push on that. And so I think, you know, like as we who care about these things kind of rise up and we get more scope of influence, we need to think more about changing policy as opposed to just writing more papers that complain about things not going right. So that's like being on, um, you know, being an associate editor, a journal and saying, well, um, we are going to push on staff 
to review code and materials and data and pushing against publishers to start up journals that aren't for profit. Um, I think that every like way that we can push on the system and its infrastructure, but that's not everybody's bread and butter. Not everybody wants to do that. When I asked Brian about that, I was like, is that what you wanted to do? Did you care about whether or not you were doing traditional academic research? And he was like, no, I didn't care. Like I'm really interested in systems change. And so I was willing to forego kind of a traditional academic path to work on systems change. And so I think like there's some of us in science who maybe want to go that route and think about systems change and think about, you know, being in leadership positions or policy change at our professional organizations or at journals. And that's kind of separate from, you know, or, or something we can't all do everything. Right. So maybe, you know, it's not complete like traditional academic research. I don't know. I'm really interested in changing how methods are done. So maybe I'm not kind of doing regular quantitative psychology research forever. Maybe I, go off and do something else. That's like personally what I'm thinking. Um, but I don't think the onus is on any individual researcher to change all of that stuff. It's just going to be this sort of slow spreading out of pushing on those incentives. I mean, another example is the psychological science accelerator. I think big team science is a remedy for a lot of the problems that you're talking about. But like everybody has to know everything and we can never get data sets that are big enough anyway. Well, we just don't have a good credit model for those studies. I had a grant reviewer on one of my grants say that it was like weird that I was on a paper that had over a hundred authors. Like how would they even know what my contribution was? Um, and so, you know, there are some people in the PSA who are actively working on changing the credit models to handle large scale studies. And this goes as far as getting, we got PNAS to change how they publish many authored papers. So it's just like a tiny little win, right? But, you know, just kind of like overall pushing on the system and pushing it to change is what keeps me um, from just like totally giving up to answer your question. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah, thanks for the talk, uh, really interesting. Um, yeah, like just um, from what of your work I've read, it, I really appreciate this like, perspective that you know measurement is this sort of unappreciated or uh, underemphasized issue with um, all this you know replication replication crisis stuff um, and I was drawing a parallel that there's also this perspective that's been argued for that like another issue that's not emphasized as much as it could be is like we just don't have great theory uh, particularly in social psych and if we had better theory we would basically be working with like less you know, suspect hypotheses in the first place that would cut down on a lot of the sort of false positives that are in the literature. Um, and that would actually deal with like some of the problems that um, we find with like, you know, issues in replication and whatnot. Um, do you think that having better theory um, would deal with some of these problems that you've addressed uh, in terms of like, you know, shoddy measurements? Or is it the case that like, even if we had great theory, we would still be left with serious issues with how we do measurement that aren't uh, dealt with in any way by having like better theory. Um, Cause like the case has been made that, you know, with, you know, problems with how we do statistics and mm -hmm. uh, those issues, if we had better theory, those would be less of a problem. Do you think that's like also the case with when it comes to measurement or is this, is there, are those separate issues that can't no, be dealt I with think, with better theory? Yeah. I think that they're really um, intertwined. I think so. Something that I run up against a lot is in working in quantitative methods with this meta science stuff is that a lot of the problems are qualitative. They're like theoretical problems. So one of the biggest problems that we see with these instruments is that they don't have a source. Well, that means that they were made up on the fly. Well, that means that they don't have a strong theoretical basis. And in that like little like rogue pyramid that was popping up and I didn't want it to down there with measurement, it says theory. Mm. It, so you can't, uh, I mean, a theoretical measurement, I don't think is as useful as theoretical measurement. And I think that if we had um, more of a requirement for really strong basis of theory, when we develop constructs, we wouldn't have like 200 different versions of what depression is. I mean, one of the biggest problems in depression measurement, um, and I'm not the expert, Ico is, but um, we've worked together on some of this stuff a little bit, is that there's no theoretical consensus on what it is. The instruments have way different uh, symptoms. There's not a lot of content overlap across instruments. That's a sign that there's no theoretical continuity. 
And so, you know, I've been thinking about this workshop and what are the interventions related to Fritz's question? But, you know, I think like, do we need to like put a moratorium on new ideas? So I, I want to like launch like this thing called the Center for No New Ideas. It has an acronym, it has an acronym already. It's called the CINI. And it's a center for no new ideas. And all we would do is try to get grants to like evaluate old ideas and do some consensus building on the theoretical basis for constructs. If we can do consensus building on theory, then we can do consensus building on measures. So I think that it's a really huge, huge problem. I think a lot of the, um, that's like kind of the, that's the heart of what measurement is. It's just like, oh, whatever. Well, if we had more expectations for the theory, we couldn't just say, oh, whatever, right? So I think there's a lot of just like skipping over uh, things that take a lot of time. They don't produce as many papers to do that kind of work. And, you know, even in the case of, um, I mean, I have even like worse tear it down uh, ideologies that I'm not fully telling you guys. But one of them is that um, when we translate these instruments, that were developed in English. So I'm doing work on instruments that we've already translated in the Psychological Science Accelerator. So we've taken instruments that were developed in English, we've translated them into like 20 something languages. And we're, about, we're developing psychometric pipelines to evaluate those instruments. But I think what we'll find out, and these are registered reports, so I don't actually know the answer yet, but I think what we'll find out is that we're like, they're fundamentally flawed theoretically. And I think what we'll have to say is that if we want to study something in a lot of languages, we have to build a theory that acknowledges the cultural variation in that concept. And then we need to, instead of retrofitting people from all over the world to whatever Western idea we had, we're going to have to like rethink all of it. And that's the best case for team science, because then you've got people from all over the world who contribute to a theory. And so it's like, I think that's a huge problem and we have to completely do it differently. That's my answer. That's a great answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. And I was especially drawn to the part where you talked about the replication study. While there are a couple of uh, large scale replication studies, there are not too many. And a lot of times, uh, one, one paper is published, one of the study contained in that paper is about replicating previous research, and the, the rest are about uh, extending the theory to a new direction. And because uh, those individual studies are too sparse, it's hard for meta science researchers and uh, researchers in adjacent field to keep track of those uh, replication studies with nested within a paper. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, do you think it would be a good idea to build a database uh, with information on which study replicated which one, and uh, maybe that can provide some information uh, to meta science researcher uh, in the way that they can pull in the <clears throat> result and uh, also provide uh, information for researchers who are coming into this area and want the information to uh, do the power analysis. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't understand why that doesn't exist. Like we have chat bots that can do everything for us and we never decided that when we do studies, they would be databased in any searchable way where we can figure out what the replications were. Like, I don't get it. I mean, it's, it should exist. You're right. That should exist. What you're talking about should exist. I mean, the fact that it could be somebody's research study to manually read hundreds of articles and figure out which of them has a replication study in it. Like we can't get machines to do that or there's not a database. It seems like, like a very good idea. <laughs> it seems like a very good idea. I mean, I just like, I, I find some of this stuff like wild, you know, that we have like thousands of journals and there's just all these studies buried into them, buried into them. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot with measurement recently where say you're interested in measuring something, you have to go read like hundreds of papers just to figure out what the definitions and all the instruments, like you can't go to like, what is the measure for this.com and get like a list. And you would think that like we would, ha we ha would have some technological infrastructure at this point. I mean, like going to space, chatbots, where you could say, you know, I want to see a list of all the replication studies of this theoretical effect that we don't have like better indexing of this kind of stuff. So I don't know if like that's something that funders won't fund. I don't really get where the barrier is there. Maybe it's just like because the technology didn't, we didn't grow up that way and how we produce papers and how papers are indexed by journals and journals don't really 
that maybe care about science that much. They're not really like dedicated to working together to make results like really machine readable or I'm not sure, but I think it's a good idea. I just got, um, I'm, Ed, I'm next door in the MERM program, measurement oh. program in education. Yeah, um, I'm, you know, I got a PhD in school of education. Yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, I'm cool with you. Great talk. Um, really. <laughs> There's um, like some. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you know. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's friendly. Let me in. So yeah, okay. yeah. They let um, you in here. <laughs> um, great talk. I feel that um, I don't know, somewhat of a kindred spirit with a lot of the validity type stuff. And I was just curious to get your um, your thought on so a phrase that drives me crazy and that I never believe when I'm reading other people's work. <clears throat> um, so going back to why does somebody choose a particular instrument or particular scale? Um, oftentimes we'll read somebody say, we chose scale X um, because it has been previously validated in the literature, citation A, B, C. And if you go look at citation A, B, and C, there's nothing in there, or at best- Yeah, I call some... this a Russian doll of validity yeah, yeah. study. It's uh, like uh, you keep looking and there's no validity like study. Where, you open up another, there's no validity the study. Evidence. At yeah, best, yeah. maybe somebody fit a factor analysis model once and reported some fits. Yes, yes. So um, I guess one, um, do you kind of roll your eyes also? And number two, <laughs> I guess, so what, or try to be practical here. What, um, what kind of one thing could we try to get people to say in place of that? If they want to, because they're trying to say something about validity, they know in some sense that that's important. Um, but so not just reporting another reliability coefficient, but what kind of like one thing could, or should we maybe encourage people to just say something a little bit about instead of just that kind of boilerplate throwaway line? Yeah, so I, I totally know what you're talking about. I call these like precedent scales because we've, so we did some stuff in my lab where we, so a lot of those didn't have citations or they had citations. And so a little of what we did at first, but it took too long. So we gave up. It was like trying to see if there was a citation, was it actually a validity study? Because when I say, oh, these scales had a source, I'm kind of implying that they are like validated. That's not the case. So if you go and look at the citation, then you get this whole Russian doll thing where then all you end up finding is that like at one point, someone made it up with some very limited evidence. And that's actually, I call those precedent scales. The validity evidence they have is just, they have precedence. They don't really have any solid evidence. So this is like a pretty big problem. And it's, it's pretty hard to spot. Some of those citations are really thorough validity studies. Some are not. Um, I think that, you know, like this really sh um, short answer about what you can report about your instruments. When I think of this, like, shortest path to at least good faith reporting would be what are so like what's the list <clears throat> of instruments you're going to use and then look at where that instrument came from is there any validity evidence in that paper if there is is it uh, applicable to the population you're studying so then you could generate like a sentence that's like this has multiple sources of validity evidence, like per the standards. And it was developed on a population similar to ours. So we're gonna use it. Or, or, and I think very reasonable to say, this has been used a lot, but does not have a strong base of validity evidence. That's a limitation of this study. Like I, I think that um, that transparency could lead to more research to evaluate, like I, I don't, so taking down a scale, I've been thinking a lot about like how to kill them, how to kill scales or reti retire them, maybe would be a better word. Like when they, they, they gain so much traction that they're really hard not to use because then reviewers are like, oh, well, you have to use this instrument. Um, and so maybe if, if we start reporting more, well, there's actually not a strong base of, of validity, but you know, this has been used a lot. That's a limitation of our study. We're going to use it anyway, that maybe that would like incite other researchers to undertake that as a as a study in and of itself because I don't think a researcher can like create all of those instruments in every given study I mean in any given study there's going to be maybe some especially if you're running if you're doing studies like the ones published in JPSP where you have a lot of instruments there's probably going to be some measures that are not that well thought out and I think we have to say well okay we're publishing them anyway so can't we just say these aren't as well thought out. That's a limitation of the study. So I think like 
a little bit more like a sentence or two that's like, this reports on multiple sources of evidence, it's applicable to our study, or this doesn't have a lot of psychometric evidence, we're only going to report a reliability coefficient, that's a limitation. And that's kind of my short answer for that. All right, so uh, we're about at time here. Um, yeah, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, looking forward, I had a couple questions that we can chat about later, oh, okay, looking yeah. forward to. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming and thank you, Jessica, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys.